next hour. It is 753. And <laughs> it's 753. I don't know. Y'all got church tomorrow. I got church tomorrow. Time change. Time. Ooh, yeah. Church for a half hour, make it to yours at eleven. It's almost nine o'clock already. Yeah, yeah. We're on that ocean time right now, so we're going. So this word is going to be quick. I want you to go with me if you have your Bibles, or as I say, if you have your Bible, that's your phone Bible. If you have your word, go with me to Matthew four. 18 through 22. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. And I'm going to be reading from the Christian standard, so your Bible might read differently from mine. Can we be old school? If you have it, say amen. amen. If, you don't, if you don't have it, say wait. <laughs> We're out for fun tonight. And the scripture says this. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he being Jesus, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. So there is this line that kept reverberating in my spirit all week. And I'm just going to read it. God is looking for the willing and not the qualified. God is looking for the willing and not the qualified. So let's break that down real quick. <coughs> you can be qualified to do something, but not want to do the work. You can have all the, all the stuff in the world. I mean, I have I have multiple degrees. I'm I'm quite intelligent and educated, but if I don't want to teach, it doesn't matter what I have behind my name. Right. It's not gonna. It's not gonna manifest. I mean, even look at Jesus' time. Jesus had to deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, think about it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were qualified to do what Jesus was doing. They were qualified to preach. They were qualified to do all this stuff, but they chose not to because it went against their power grab. So let, let me let me school you on some Bible stuff to make sure you know how I read stuff. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were literally like the, the Republicans and the Democrats of our modern day. <laughs> the Pharisees were the party of the poor. The Sadducees were the party of the rich. The Pharisees are like, okay, you know, keep everything how it needs to be. The Sadducees are like, woo, Hellenism, everybody, yeah. Like, so they're trying, so they're battling forces, but they have one thing in common. They didn't like Jesus. That's right. And the reason why they didn't like Jesus, because Jesus was like, y'all ain't doing your job, but God, has sent, but God has sent me down here to balance things out so that way the people oh, boy, can yeah. do the work of God because those who were qualified to do the job and it was they didn't have to apply for it it was literally they were born into it you were you were taught from from birth that you were qualified to do this job but you chose but they chose not to do it so Jesus after he was tempted went to go find some friends and just walk just probably walking and minding his own business and God's like hey See those guys right there? Go get them. Ain't you no know, Jesus is obedient to his daddy. He's a good son. And he looks like these rough necks. Fishermen were, it wasn't like, oh yeah, fishermen, I'm gonna be a fisherman. No, nah, it's just you, that's what you did. Jesus, who was a carpenter, he was a Pharisee by teaching, but he was a carpenter by trade. So Jesus, this carpenter, is walking up to these guys 
Walk it up to make sure I get it right. He's walking up to Peter and Andrew like, hey, put your nets down. I'll teach y'all to fish some men. They could have been like, nah, bro, you crazy. Nah, I'm not doing that. But instead they're like, okay. And then James and John. Hey, come on. Come with me. Stop fishing fish. Let's fish some people. Oh, okay. Left it. And the thing is, they left their daddy. Like, they're, that's special. They left their family. They left what they knew to go and follow this, this, this random carpenter from Nazareth. Probably never seen him before. So I like they were like, oh, I'm at the high school with Jesus. Okay, he could. <laughs> well, they, they didn't have high school back then, but you know what I mean. Oh, I, I went to Temple. Oh, he was in the He sat in the third row with his hand. He knew the word. No. <clears throat> God is looking at us and saying, I'm not looking for, like, the people who have been qualified to do this work have, have literally said, I'm not going to do that. He's looking for those who are willing. He does not care about your past. I don't know. I think this might be the whole message. He does not care about your past. He doesn't care about where you came from. Yes, I look good now, but my past was messy. I got a story. All of us have a story. All of us have been through things, but we have this concept in our mind that if, if I don't look pristine and perfect, I have no worth. There's a song that we do, and it says, one of the verses is, you take the good things out of the bad things. You find the precious from the worthless soul. I love that song. You should have did it tonight. <laughs> but, God, but God literally sees you and says, you, you have something in you. You have something to offer. No matter what you, you've done before Christ, what, 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 what happened before Christ is designed to be a roadmap that while you're in Christ, you can look, some, look at somebody who was in your same situation and say, listen, I went through that too, but I know a man. Yeah. Praise God. Who makes a way of escape. Yes. The devil always makes it out. There's no exit strategy. Oh, there's an exit strategy. And it's called Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. Amen. But sometimes we as believers forget that because we don't look like we have it enough and have it all together. I even struggle with it at times. I was talking with one of my college students and I said, the thing I've been learning about in this year, me teaching just, just college, is that I have to understand my worth. We're sitting there looking, looking at my, looking, looking at my CV, looking at all the stuff I've done. Like, look, I've taught, taught high school for nine years. I'm teaching at three different colleges now, pastoring the church, starting a business, you know, being a minister of music for for years. You know, publication after publication, CDs, all these things that are that are that are here. But I could not see my worth because I didn't think I was enough. I couldn't see what I had to offer, what God had blessed me with. Because all of, all of the stuff I've done has not been by my own power. It has been by the power and the grace Lord and the God. mercy and the kindness and the favor of God. That's right. Yes. So the key for us as believers is that we need to begin to call out calling. Call forth purpose and calling in those yeah. that you're around. Yes. Call yeah. forth purpose and calling within yourself. Don't just sit back and be like, oh, well, you know, I'm called in the elect of God. If the Pharisees and the Sadducees spoke into the people like Jesus did, they probably, they probably would have been, wouldn't have been in bondage in the first place. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted to, wanted to stay in bondage because they kept them comfortable. Jesus has literally came to earth to bring life, to speak life. Y'all remember the whole thing about talk to your plants. 
I was, I was, when I was a kid, I'm like, why do you talk? It's not going to respect. It's not going to go, ah, I'm a plant. It's not going to respond to me. <laughs> it's not going to talk back to me. It's just, it's just like I'm here, I'm oxygenating and all this stuff. But I remember watching my grandma. And my grandma's from Bessemer, Alabama. And she has a little itty bitty house on the north side of Columbus. And she gardens to this day. She gardens. I mean, she'll have her flowers in the front, but she got her greens. She has an okra. I've seen this woman grow corn in the middle of the hood. Had a, when I was growing up as a kid, she had a, she had a peach tree. She had a whole she had a she had a grapevine. She had strawberries. She had everything. But it was fall. We didn't have to go shopping for vegetables. We just went to her house. But my mom and I ended up living with her after uh, my mom divorced my stepfather. And we spent a lot of time together during the summer. And she walked me, I actually wrote a poem about this. She wrote, she walked me down to this weird looking house on the end of the street. This house looked like a junkyard from the horror movies, I'm telling you. It was blowing down like, if I get tetanus or get shot, I blame you. She's like, baby, you're gonna be fine. And he had this man had collar had collar brain. Have you ever seen collard greens in the ground? Like it's just, it's like a big old leaf. Mm -hmm. Collard greens, turnip, mustard, kale, had all these vegetables. My grandma turned around and looked at the ground and she saw these little piddly, piddly mustards. And she said, I want them. I looked at her, I'm like, I'm like, grandma, look at these things. It's like, like five little leaves, the leaves, the, the leaves are like, uh, let me die, just kill me. <laughs> I won't yield anything. I can't yield anything. But my grandma said, you know what? Give me, give me, give me the green. The guy's like, he ain't got this beer, he ain't got bottom. We walked back. My grandma said, give me a glass of water, of cold water. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Got her a glass of cold water, like a little, little small glass of cold water. She put it on the table. She's like, now hand me that miracle girl behind you. She poured the miracle girl in there. And then she put the greens in the miracle girl. And she looked at those greens and said, baby, I need y'all to grow. Like, I need y'all to grow big and strong. She let him sit on, she let him just sit in the miracle grow. Eventually they, they started getting some life back in. They, they went from, ah, to, okay, I can make it. I think I can. I think, oh, sunlight, yes. <laughs> to the point they got big enough to replant. So she planted them in the ground. Those are some of the best tasting mustard greens I had in my life. <laughs> In the same way, I saw her minister to a woman who ended up being my aunt-in-law. This woman would come to our house every single day. She would just walk up because her parents lived on. So my grandma lives on the center street, but there's a circular street around the neighborhood. This woman's parents lived in the same circle. Let me tell you about this woman. This woman wanted to be a part of our family since she was a child. She would see my mom and my aunts and my uncle, and they always look good. My grandmama made sure her babies look good in the midst of, a, of being abused and battered. She made sure her babies were good. She wanted to be a part of our family so bad. She ended up marrying somebody. They got divorced, had three kids. She ended up marrying my uncle. We won't talk about that, but something good came out of that marriage nonetheless. So here she comes, switching down the street. Hi, Miss Berry. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, Lord, let me get this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you know me because of her. I'm like, oh, you're evil for that. You know that, right? I'm like, you know, what? But my, I watched my grandma every day for years. Look at this woman and talk to them like she talked to the green. 
Baby, I know life's going to look good for you right now, but you got to stop playing these games. You, you got some value to you. See, grandma's like, grandma's like, you beautiful. You got a whole shape. You got all these kids. You blessed. Just what's your problem? Why are you chasing after men? So, really, get her too. But you enough. You have something to offer. Based her in the word. It's a miracle, girl, like with the rings. The, the instructions were put, give me some water. Let me put some miracle grow in that. And I'll just let you sit in, sit, sit in the miracle grow, sit in the word. Let me minister to your heart where it is. Let me put strength back into your body. And the thing is, it's significant that, that the story talks about Peter, James, and John. Because they were the three closest to Jesus. Not a whole lot of message, but I'm just uh, we're gonna I'm just gonna leave, leave here because somebody needs to hear this. They were the closest to Jesus. They were his road dogs. Just Jesus had a lot of followers. <clears throat> he had about nine other disciples, but they were these three. These were the ones who were right, who were standing watch with him when he was having having his only argument with God. If if it be your will, God, take this cup. I want it. Take it. Praying and sweating blood. Now, granted, they fell asleep. He was like, for real, I'll just fell asleep. But he watched them develop. As you get in relationship with God, he will develop you into who you're called to be. That's the thing. That people are afraid of, of that intimacy with God because they think. It's a place of judgment. No, it's not. It's a place of growth. It's that miracle grow water that he just puts you in there. And as you're with him, he develops you. He speaks to you. He speaks life into you. He speaks purpose. He speaks hope into you. Even in difficult times. Because some greens was in that cup when it was raining. When it was cold on occasion because it was a summer. When it was a tornado watch, the greens were still on, that, on, the, on there. My grandma would come out and once a while when the water got low, just pour water in them. When Jesus had to deal with Peter, James, and John, he probably, he probably, he watered everybody. He really watered them. They didn't have PhDs in theology. They didn't have a big old major mega church. All they had was what God gave them. What was already in them. And all Jesus did was say, babies. Well, brothers, I need y'all to grow. He, he really gave Peter the business. He looked at Peter and said, listen, you got to betray me two times. Peter, no, I'm with you. I'll ride with you. <laughs> no, okay, y'all remember I'm a millennial from Columbus. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm right or die, Jesus. I got you, Jesus. Aren't you with Jesus? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, no, you look familiar. I don't know what he literally cussed him out. <laughs> no, you look, you look, you, you Peter with Jesus, right? I said, I don't know who you talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and he, like, literally, Peter went into hiding because he's like, oh, I messed up. I messed up. But when Jesus was resurrected, it was around before, before he was gone. He restored Peter. Hallelujah. He restored him. And in the restoration he said, you are a rock, you are enough. Petra, Petras, Peter, you are enough. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're enough. You're enough to take over from me. You're enough to while I'm, while I'm seated by my father, you're able, you are, you are enough to help change, flip this world upside down. That I've never really seen a religion in, in, in history that literally flipped the world upside down. Ever. I mean, we, we, got, we have all these other religions, but there's something about Christianity that literally the whole, the calendar changed. That's right. Yeah. The whole calendar changed. Oh, because Jesus invested time in people and said, you are enough. Amen. So I'm, I'm telling you this tonight. 
I don't know what you're dealing with. I'm not a spooky prophet. I don't, I'm not all up in your business. But I want to tell you that what you have is enough. What God has already put in your hands is enough to do the work of the kingdom. No one's asking you to be the next Benny Hinn, Paula White, whatever, whatever, whatever. God's asking you to be you. The Bible says, for they were redeemed by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Yeah. So the blood washes you. In Hebrews it says, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. The blood of Jesus negates anything anybody can say about you, even in your past. But your testimony is the roadmap to bring other people out. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you have to believe that you have value. You have worth in the kingdom. It is not the job of one person to be the whole finger or the whole mouth of God. The thing is, we have all these people in the kingdom, and God reminded me how cells work. Yes, we are all like one big old body experience, but we are made by what? Cells. And each cell, based on, the, on its DNA marker, is told what to do. It's the same way in the kingdom. The Holy Spirit has given you purpose, calling, and destiny to do what he's called you to do. And put you apart, make you a, a small part in the greater body of Christ so that people may come to the knowledge of Jesus. So don't beat yourself up because you're not at where you think you are. Do not despise the days of small beginnings. <coughs> what did Jesus say? What, what Jesus said is, said is repeatedly, even in the parable, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Take the story of my church as that. That I literally, and you'll tell, like, they would tell you. Because they get to hear me cry and whine and fuzzy. He's like, get over it. <laughs> 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 that there was a time I was like, I was about to shut the doors because I'm like, we only got like three people. We got four people. Oh, we just lost a whole group of people. Yes. I don't know how we're going to do this. And God literally had to speak. I was driving to work. God, God literally spoke to me in the car. And he flat out said to me, quit comparing yourself to everybody else. Quit comparing true vision to all these other churches in town. I called, did not call them, call you to be them. I called you to be you. I called you to be you. Being a forerunner means that you're going to be ahead of your time when you start. But everyone's about to meet where you are. So do not despise the day of small beginnings. Be faithful to what I'm giving you. You know, I was feeling that too. Feeling that too. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Remember the word I gave you that God's going to, this is the mechanism to do things that you wanted to do. I'm going to take it a step further. A lot of the reason why you weren't able to do the things that you were that you wanted to do even when your husband was alive was because of the role that you were in in the church and also the fact also your gender. That even Lancaster and I know Charlotte can attest to this, my wife can attest to this, that that people that a lot of pastors and this needs to be broken in the name of Jesus yeah. have an issue with women in leadership. Yeah. That every time there seemed like to be a, that you wanted to open the door, that God, that there was a door being open, literally a man would literally stand in front of it and say, literally, but it's like Gandalf, you shall not pass. Yeah. But it's 2020. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and God is opening doors for you to fulfill the visions that he showed you way back in the 80s and in the 90s. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Now, here's the thing. This is not meant for you to start up a church. It's not, that's not, that's not, you're like, I, that, 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 that was my husband's job. That wasn't me. But it's your job to be a mother to a motherless generation. There are women who are going to cross your path who need what literally was in your hand. They need what's in your hand. They need what you have to offer because we are at a deficit in the spirits, particularly in this area. We are in a deficit of spiritual mothers because the fathers stifled or assassinated the anointing that many women carried. So God's using you 
and the women who come around you because there's wisdom, there's so much, there's wisdom and insight in this room. God's using you to mother a generation. There'll be some women who are older than you who will be like, Mama Sally. And you'll be like, you ought to be my mama. <laughs> but they see what God has in you. So you are enough. You are enough. Because our God is more than enough. And even, and even with you, same thing. There's a, there, there is a need for spiritual mothering that is not going to destroy or manipulate. You are one of the sweetest people I've ever met. You like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just honored to know you. But there's a generation who needs mothering, and, and you, you're, you're a mama bear through and through. Oh yeah. You'll love them, but you have no you have no shame clawing them a little bit. Just get it right. <laughs> but you, but God's going to send women your way. Don't be surprised if you get more calls for women's conferences. And it's not going to be on the strength of Him. Somebody's going to hear just hear about hear your name. You y'all y'all about to go to places that you never thought you could enter into. Both of you. But it's going to be more some at times separate than, than it is going to be together. But the beauty is what I love about y'all, and I use this as a model for my own marriage, that y'all stand back to back. And as when one's in the front, the other covers. Even when you're separated. I know y'all calling back and forth and praying. He's like, he's like, I gotta go to Indy. Okay, I'll hold it down, I'll hold down the church. We got this, go. But God is opening up doors for you to do great things. God's opening up doors for you to do great things. And I'm excited to see it. I'm just going to sit back and be like, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know her. She good. She good. Y'all better preach. <laughs> Praise God. But you are, you're enough. That's, that's the word for today. You are enough. You have so much to offer the kingdom. You have so much to offer the kingdom. Are you going to church anywhere? Um, firehouse. Okay, you in the right place. Good. You have a lot to offer the kingdom, and now that what God's going to be doing with you in the next year or two is He is He is going to be teaching you how to do what you're called to do. I see you with a lasso. This is really cool. I see. I see you in a lasso that you're. You're standing outside of a pit, and there are women who are like, help me, help me. I see a lot of women in poverty. I also see a lot of women who are who have been drug addicted. There's like a whole list. There's a lot of women, and I see you just pulling them in. Nice boy. God's, God's gonna, God is about to teach you how to really evangelize. Nice boy. And the thing is, don't let don't let people make it so that you your your place is not standing up behind the pulpit and being all I'm an evangelist. It is your it, it is your place to go out and do. And God has put you under an apostolic anointing that will teach you how to do that. So just just stick in the word. Stick, just stick in the word. Go to the school of ministry. Stick like the school ministry they do on Sunday mornings. Just stay in the word, build relationships, and God's going to teach you through doing how to bring people to the knowledge of Christ, and do it in a way that doesn't scare them, that doesn't destroy them, that doesn't belittle them, but it'll be through love. Yes. Here's the thing about Jesus's miracles: Jesus didn't do miracles because he had the power to do miracles. Compassion, yes, because of his compassion, has been opened. And it's going to be the same way with you. That, that while, while, while you're, I see you hitting the streets. Now while you're on the streets, just walking around town, you're going to run into people who are broken and you will be filled heaven open over your head. And you're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. So you're enough. Hi. Hi. <laughs> 
He's trying to be good. Did you almost not come tonight? Okay. <laughs> this word has been affirmation to you and also confirmation. I don't know whose thumb has been on your neck, but I break that right now in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that every restraint has been broken off of your life because you pressed your way out here. That freedom is going to be a part of your life now in ways you've never seen before. That you feel like there's literally been a, a millstone put, by, put around your neck and you've been walking and dragging your heels and even in, in even in your relationships, I, I, just, I feel like there's been a lot of dragging of the heels, but God is saying, I'm giving you the strength to run. I've taken the millstone off of you. You're about to see how strong you really are. Praise the Lord. Because the thing is, with dragging weight, and I say this as someone who used, to, who used to be very heavy, that as you drag weight, your body gets used to it. But as soon as the weight comes off, you still you have that same level of strength as if the weight was on, so you're able to do stuff you didn't know you could do. <laughs> no, like like seriously, like I scare people. I'm, I'll do leg presses at the gym. They're like, that's six hundred pounds. Okay, I'm just three hundred. So, <laughs> but but the millstone did to you. But the weight did to you. Yeah, it held you back, but God has made you stronger. You're about to see your strength right now. Oh, great God. I, I literally hear in the spirit that you're about to catch your breath. Mm -hmm. That you you feel like you've been struggling and wheezing in the spirit, and God is saying, "I'm I'm, I'm you're about to you're about to be able to breathe again." Do you sing? No. I gotta sing this. You wanna hear it? <laughs> you sing it to the Lord, but I kept so like I kept hearing like you know you're gonna you're gonna sing a new song unto the Lord. That yeah. That 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 that. The song of lament that has been a part of your life for the past five to ten years is about to be changed into a song of praise. It's going to be like the song of Miriam. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. I will sing unto the Lord most high. The horse and the rider have been cast into the sea. So what you're saying is that all my enemies are behind me. They're, they're behind me and dead and drowned. So I'm able to walk in freedom. And Miriam wasn't just standing there singing. Miriam and the girls had their tambourines. It was getting it. Because they were free. The first time, they weren't singing from a place of lament anymore. They weren't singing from a place of bondage. They were singing from a place of freedom. So God, so God is going to give you a new song. It's a metaphor for a new speech that you will no longer speak of yourself in deficit. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. God. But you will speak the goodness of God over yourself. And everyone around you will have no choice but to honor the woman of God that you are. Okay. So y'all gonna take the fall preach fast. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Do you have a hand sanitizer? Germs 